Hello, oral surgery colleagues, and welcome to the Oral Surgery Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Richard Moore, an oral surgeon based in the United Kingdom. The aim of this podcast channel is to discuss ways of improving practice in oral surgery, thereby creating a better journey and patient experience, and allowing us as clinicians to become better oral surgeons. All discussions on this channel are based on personal experience and opinions, which should be thought-provoking and supplemented with further research and evidence-based practice. Without further ado, let's jump into this podcast. Hello everybody and welcome to this podcast. I'm delighted to have Dr. Wendy Thompson with me today, who is an NIHR clinical lecturer in primary dental care at the University of Manchester. So welcome, Wendy. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. I, I first met you, uh, oh, I can't remember how many years ago, probably probably four-ish, when you were doing your PhD at Leeds. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, I think you were just starting out in your PhD and I was just finishing mine. Yeah. So, yeah. Very envious mind still dragging on. But um, it's great to have you here. Um, and I think just for our listeners, because you've got such a unique background, it, um, if in a nutshell you could just tell everybody... Um, perhaps your story from first degree to to where you are now. Yeah, okay. Um, So my first degree was um, microbiology degree, straight out of my A-levels, you know, as everyone does, um, at the University of Warwick. And I then went to work down in Whitehall as a scientist um, for mm, 10 years there or thereabouts, a bit of mat leave in the middle of it, Um, and uh, didn't touch anything to do with microbiology at all the time that I was there. I was doing things like buying aircraft carriers and... um, Oh, that sounds exciting. Defense, a whole range of different stuff, um, w- which is interesting. And, and you'll see how it all links in, in later on. Um, and then uh, my daughter was born and my husband came out of the army and we decided to move back north again. I'm from Lancashire originally. We moved back back to the area. Um, and that was um, an opportunity really to take stock. I was in my um, early 30s, you know, which way next? What is it that I want to do? They don't have white or scientists in Lancashire, so, so what am I going to do? Um, and the opportunity arose, and I, I think that's one of the things I'm going to say, is that luck comes to those people who are open to the opportunity, and I've been really lucky, really, really lucky since I um, had the opportunity to do dentistry on this brand new course at UCLAN um, with a dental education centre less than 10 miles down the road from home. You know, when does when does that happen? Oh, so you could just um, roll out of bed. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> kind of. But yeah, it was closer than going to Manchester, which is what I'd originally been thinking I might have to do when I was looking at dentistry. So after moving to Lancashire and this opportunity arose to do dentistry, I took it. I loved it. I, I did well on the course um, and I went out and did my foundation dentistry. Now it's just 10 years ago this year that I did my foundation dentistry up in the south of Cumbria. Um, I'm a country girl um, and working in a country practice, it, it reminds me of the old all creatures great and small kind of practice. We're in. <laughs> yeah, or peak yeah. practice. <laughs> if, it, if a farmer calls up and says they've got toothache, they've really got toothache <laughs> and you really need to see them now. <laughs> it's because because it's a different style of dentistry, um, and, yeah. but I love it. It's it's me. Um, and uh, when people, when I did my reflections in undergrad, and when I still do them now, um, they almost all finish, and then the patient smiled. And for me, it's that that buzz you get when you've made a difference for somebody. When they came in in pain, or when they came in um, with um, teeth that they weren't happy with, and you've able you've been able to do not just their teeth, but you've you've made a difference to them as a person and their personality. That's that's the smiling thing. It isn't just a physical thing. It's um it's a whole emotional yeah. um that goes with it. Um, and when I finished my foundation, or when I was doing my foundation dentistry, actually, we did an audit. Um, we did about antimicrobial prescribing, and obviously, with having a microbiology degree, that fits with me. Um, and having a Whitehall background. Um, When I was writing it up, I was kind of feeling that there was a bigger picture going on here and that it wasn't just about some clinical guidelines that people were or weren't following, but there was a whole whole scope of stuff. So when I wrote my report up, I wrote it like a government report, really, um, and it got picked up and and shown to a few people. um, And from there, I was um, invited on to to apply to be on a nice committee about antimicrobial uh, stewardship. Um, And then from there, someone said, well, you should think about doing a PhD. And here's my next lucky step. I went, oh, me, do a PhD, just, get out of here. Don't be, don't be stupid. But when, when you did that first yes. audit, the, were, the, were the findings astonishing to you or unsurprising? 
because you're obviously quite junior in, in your yeah, dental career. Yeah, very junior in my dental career. And um, I guess I didn't really know what I was going to find. Um, okay. What, what, what did, did you find? find that we people found that just... there was a very big difference between practices. Some practices, there was a right. lot of antibiotic prescribing going on and some there was hardly any. But um, I did my foundation training up in Health Education North East um, because South Cumbria <laughs> okay. at the time was part of that area. Um, so I was getting to look at prescriptions from practices up in Blythe and you know places I have no clue where they are. Yeah. Um, I know that Blythe's absolutely beautiful in the countryside around it and, and not so beautiful in the t- town itself. Um, but other than that, you know, I didn't know whether they're appropriate prescribing or not appropriate prescribing. So yeah. I couldn't really make okay. a judgment on it. Um, but from um, getting involved at the policy level, if you like, um, and someone saying, well, you should do a PhD. That night, literally, I got home, opened my um, British Dental Journal up, and there was an advert from University of Leeds for these anniversary um, research scholarships. Wow. Um, and it had my name written all over it. It was, it was it, meant to as be. As I say, this, this whole thing about <laughs> luck coming to those people who are open to the opportunity. Yeah. So I um, I applied for it and, and got it with um, it was a, a lady called Julie Burke. You probably know Julie. She's up in yeah, I know Julie yeah. really so well. She was yeah. my supervisor at the time. And then <laughs> within three months of joining joining Leeds she came to me she said Wendy I've got got something to tell you I'm, I'm leaving, <laughs> I'm leaving. <laughs> so so Gail Douglas became my first supervisor she's um dental public health um and yeah then, who's my supervisor oh. or one of one of my super yeah so I know yeah, Gail really yeah. well as well um and then Sue Pavitt was one of my um uh, was one of the other supervisors as well so Sue is a methodologist and um, she's worked in dental mm. schools around the country um and she um is a big cheese in the NIHR National Institute for Health Research. She heads up, well, she didn't at the time, but she does now, heads up the oral and dental research portfolio. Yeah. I mean, she helped me um, apply for a, um, a doctoral research fellowship, um, which um, was worth about £330,000, I think it was. So it paid me to be a salaried dentist. Um, uh, so it paid my salary as a dentist and to do the research Um, and uh, it allowed me to work one day a week in practice. I found it really difficult working just one day a week in practice. Um, You kind of, it's not great for patients because they can only see you one one day a week if something happens, other people have to pick up your um, problems. Yeah. But the other thing was that um, you you kind of, you wouldn't see very much of, of, it sounds kind of strange really you you can't get started if you like one day a week i do two days at the moment and it's a lot a lot better um and mm. so uh, if anyone is thinking about doing a, a phd with some clinical time i would say try and do it try and do the research more part-time and the uh, academic a bit more than one day a week probably two days a week um, and that gives you more time for your academic work because when you're when you're applying for all the approvals and all of the um, there is so much admin that goes on when you do research Mm. that it just gives you more time it isn't you that takes it it isn't your own personal time that takes a lot of time with the admin it's submitting paper for this and then it goes through committee after committee until it finally comes back to you so it takes six months for something to happen then that's a long time out of your three-year phd but if you're doing it yeah 50 percent time on like uh, 50 percent full-time equivalent as your phd then that's a six-year phd that six months for your approvals is like a lot less of an impact on what you're doing yeah so that's what I would uh, that that's um, my learning really from from doing the PhD so yeah so I got um uh, an NIHR grant to or a doctoral research fellowship um and the title of my PhD is antibiotic prescribing towards a reduction during urgent dental care in England Um, and in hindsight it's the most ironic title in the world because I graduated (laughs) in December 2019 um, within three months, uh, antibiotic prescribing in dentistry in England had gone up by 25% <laughs> rather than down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised it was only 25%, yeah. to be honest. But... In Scotland, it was a lot more. It's probably. Um, but in yeah. England, it was it was 25%, yeah, for those three months. And then it's it's been steadily, very, very slowly, but steadily coming down back to, back to pre-pandemic okay. levels again. So that's a good good sign, sign. isn't it? Um, And so my, as part of my research, I started off by doing a systematic review because all good PhDs start with a systematic review to tell you what's already out there in the literature. My systematic review was saying what factors um, 
are associated with the decision whether to prescribe an antibiotic. I wasn't interested in mm. what antibiotic was being prescribed because actually if someone's okay. taken an antibiotic, um, if, you, um, if they've experienced an antibiotic, then their microbiome, their, their um, uh, bacterial flora around them will have changed. It will have resistant bugs in it, even if you only take one yeah. dose. So you're better off taking none at all. Than, and it doesn't okay. the actual antibiotic that you take it is important because there's different drug bug combinations that are um, resistance um yeah but it's the decision whether to prescribe at all which is more important so there's, there's about 80 okay. percent over prescribing of antibiotics in dentistry yeah. and, and do you think that's still 80 percent now or that was before during well, your that PhD? was um, a, a study that anwin cope did um uh, about two 2016 I think it was um, and it came down okay. a bit from that but it, but nowhere nowhere near the 80 percent that she found um over um and, and do you think that's and then so what I was going to say was and during I COVID could... we went back up to that 2016 level so, yeah. yeah and do you think that's comparable in medicine uh, medicine's a lot lower over prescribing mm-hmm. yeah you see, anecdotally, you kind of feel it's the other way, don't you? Well, I do. I'm, I'm could yeah, be completely wrong with that. Yeah, it might be the context that. that you're working in, Richard. Um, so, yeah, um, it, it's because I think primary care dentistry is obviously very different to to secondary care. Um, yeah, and it's the urgent dental uh, um, urgent dental yeah. Um, uh, yeah. system as well. So it isn't just what's happening in routine dental practices. They're lower yeah. prescribers. It's what goes on in the urgent dental clinics themselves. So, um, yeah. uh, so the factors uh, it won't surprise you to know there were a whole range of factors because if it was just a simple issue with one or two factors, then then you can solve that. But we found about yeah. twenty eight factors um, that was in the literature. Wow. Um, and the w- what we did, we said when I started doing the PhD, there was hardly anything in the literature about dentistry. So we started off doing a systematic review that looked at primary care medicine and primary care dentistry, and then compared and contrasted them. And by the time we'd finished doing this, doing the systematic review searches and, and analysis for a start, we found there'd been some more dental studies published. So we, we redid it again. So we ended up with quite a substantial review. So, um, uh, yeah, 28 factors, potentially modifiable factors. There were some that weren't modifiable as well. So things like the patient age and gender, things like um, yeah. whether the practice is rural or urban, you can't do anything about that. Um, they do affect the rate of antibiotic prescribing um, in different countries as well, because a systematic review isn't just in the UK. So, uh, so yeah, then I okay. looked at the factors and I said, yeah, you know, some of them, especially the, some of the dental interview studies, it just kind of smacked to me of um, someone who wasn't a dentist interviewing someone who was a dentist and being told, ah, oh, well, you know, the reason is, and then not having the background to really the insight to understand what was being said to them or to challenge what mm. was being said to them. Maybe and they just took it as read that it was um, okay. And that it was relevant. So what I wanted to do was um, an ethnographic study. So what you do on an ethnographic study is you watch what actually happens. You don't, you don't poke the subjects to see what happens. If you poke them, you literally just watch and you say, what, what happens normally now purely and simply the fact of you being there watching means that people might change their, um, their behavior yeah, uh, th- through the Hawthorne effect. But actually, urgent dental appointments are so short that there's not much time to change what you would normally have done. Um, and uh, that's what we found pretty much. You know, um, we knew that we were going to find um, clinical practice that wasn't directly in line with guidelines. Um, and we wanted to be able to see that because we want to see why people are over prescribing. We didn't want to put them off doing what they would normally do. Um, and yeah. uh, so we thought really carefully about how to do the ethics of this. So uh, getting the ethical approval was quite interesting. Normally, when you're getting ethical approval for a subject, uh, for a study, you need to um, give people participants a couple of days to think about whether they want to participate before they go ahead. But in an urgent dental setting, you can't because you don't know who's going to come in with toothache in two days time. So we had to find a different way of doing that. Um, and the... Um, yeah, so, so the ethics um, of, of doing this, we needed to make sure that it was okay for the clinicians to be watched and observed and not feel that they might be dobbed in it to their managers or to the GDC or sure. whoever. Um, and so we thought really carefully about this and I spoke to the GDC and I spoke to um, uh, various people around and about, about how to do this. And that what they told me was, don't see a pattern of behaviour. 
because you would only need to report it if you saw a pattern and a pattern is three so don't see don't see it three times so what we did we audio recorded because it you don't know who's going to be turning up with toothache when so you can't just sit there and watch all the time just in case someone turns up so um in in the general dental practice setting we just audio recorded the appointments um, and it was the practices who did it themselves we trained them on how to um to set the recordings up in the right way for us um, and in the out of hours dental settings, um, we got them to audio record them. But we also had some sessions where we actually had um, someone sitting in the appointments watching. But again, they couldn't be a dental registrant because they couldn't see something actually happen. Because if a dental registrant sees something wrong going on, then they need to to step in and say, no, that's wrong. Sure. So we needed to yeah. make sure that the person observing was also safe. And that I, as a researcher, was safe. Um, so we audio recorded appointments. We audio recorded about 10 appointments per um, dentist. Uh, and then we just selected off the basis of some uh, outline um, information that they gave us about each of the appointments, you know, what treatment they'd done, what. Um, uh, and then they had an opportunity to write a little comments at the bottom of the, the sheet that they were leaving us. Um, and we selected using a, um, a sampling strategy to get a full range of different kinds of patients and um, uh, yeah, uh, clinical uh, situations. Um, uh, and so we, for each dentist, we only saw two patients. We only sorry, followed up with two patients. Okay. So we um, did follow up interviews with the dentist and with a patient and with a dental nurse. Um, to understand what we'd heard on the transcripts for those particular appointments. Um, and that's uh, enabled us to see all of those 28 factors that we'd seen from the systematic review, plus another four factors that hadn't been reported in the literature before. Okay. Yeah. That's um, and from those factors, we'd um, mapped them over to um, a behavioral framework called the COMBI model. So yeah, COMBI yeah, yeah. Um, means uh, if you want to change behavior, that's the B then you, you have three things to look at, the com bit of it. So C is capability. That means their ability to, to do the, the skill. Do they have the skill? Do they have the knowledge? Um, uh, um, do they have the... Um, yeah, there's a whole range of things around capability. Um, o is for opportunity. So do they have the time to do it, the opportunity to do it during the appointment? Do they have the... Um, equipment to do it do they have um, the setting to do it so that's o for opportunity and m is motivation um and do they can i swear on this um no. probably okay, not okay, okay. <laughs> um, do, do they do they um so the motivation is do they really want to give antibiotics or do they really not want to give antibiotics what's their personal motivation what what are their beliefs about the risks and the yeah. benefits of antibiotics um, and so um, that's the combi model in short for you. So um, we'd mapped all of those 20, oh, 32 factors now onto the combi model. Um, and here's where we started bringing in the patients and um, public uh, to and members of the dental team to help us sort through that list of 32 and decide, well, which factors of these are we actually going to work into an intervention? Yeah, um, yeah. And I'd started thinking around this sort of time again about um shared decision making consent um in urgent dental well during routine dental appointments you say to people um do you you say to dentists do you consent your patients before um before you do treatment and they say of course i do and you say do you consent them before antibiotics and they go uh you know do you explain the risks and the benefits to them before prescribing an antibiotic um and they don't and i yeah, you know, no. It's not something we're kind of taught to do, but but it really needs to be. It's a treatment, and they have yeah, it is a treatment, yeah. Um, and especially <laughs> if it's something like implants, which I know as oral surgeons you'll be really interested in. Um, implants is um. Oh, help me out, Richard. What's the word I'm looking for? Um, an elective treatment. So placing yeah. implants is an elective treatment. So people have time to think about whether they want to um, have them done in a particular way, a particular kind of implant. Um, and they also should be having the opportunity to think about the risks and benefits of antibiotics um, yeah. as part of that treatment. Um, it, it's interesting you say that because I, I generally do give an antibiotic dose before the implant, but I will talk to the patient and say, you know, I'm going to offer you this. It, there's no evidence really, well, there's probably more evidence to say you don't need to give it. 
but it makes me feel better and I'll probably sleep better tonight and I think you probably would and if I was having an implant I think I might want just that one dose you would probably shoot me down now having said that and I know that um Robbie Williams did his MSc in this as well who's hopefully going to come and speak on the podcast about antibiotics and because you know the the general consensus of people is well we'll we'll give them one dose and it'll be fine and it's usually two grams of amoxicillin but actually, do we really need to do that? But then if that implant fails and you haven't given the antibiotic, are we practicing defensive dentistry? And we probably are because, you know, I think people are worried about, uh, am I negligent by not giving it? If if it fails, is the patient, you know, going to raise yeah, a complaint, so, so et cetera? It's so it's, it's, it's it? tricky. I mean, there, it's defensive dentistry either way. And it's really, really difficult to know. And it's really a case of yeah. uh, explaining the risks and benefits to the patients. Yeah. Um, uh, mm. And it's hard. But I've, I've not had a patient yet say, no, I don't want Have antibiotics. Have you had a patient yet come back to you and say they've had C. diff infection afterwards? Or No, not yet. Yeah. <laughs> but time uh, time yes. will tell. And I'm guessing with a single dose of amoxicillin, I, I know the risk is still there, but it, it's probably, well, I'm hoping you're going to say it's the lowest risk for the lowest um, with that antibiotic. So there's but... um, cases in the literature now, uh, and uh, not just in the literature, but cases um, that are going through medical legally where people are coming coming to the, well, so there's, there's one yeah. case I'm thinking of in particular um, from down south, and the patient said after it was all cleared up and it had gone through the medical legal thing, why didn't you tell me that could happen? You know, I would probably still have had antibiotics, yeah. but at least I'd have known what it was. I knew, yeah. It's so difficult, isn't it? Because you just feel that everything's against you yeah. as a clinician and the challenges are just mounting up. But I think I, the shared decision-making is so yeah. important and I totally agree so with I'd you started, on that, that for, for any yeah. part of dentistry. So I started yeah. thinking about shared decision-making while I was going through all of these factors with the patients. It was A lot of them were looking like the kind of things where where it was about talking to patients, really. Um, and during urgent dental appointments, you don't have an awful lot of time to talk to patients, no, do you? Yeah. Um, and so I started <laughs> no. asking, you know, the whole Montgomery thing as well, you know, you're supposed to find out yeah. whether they play the trombone and whether, they, <laughs> whether they've got a particular concert tonight that, or tomorrow that might be particularly important <laughs> that you can do it today rather than tomorrow and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and uh, so I, because I'd sat on a nice committee before, uh, I contacted a friend because I'd read a, a nice document, something that nice had written. And I just said, how does Montgomery fit into all of this? And and they kind of went, Montgomery? And I went, yeah, yeah you, <laughs> you know, that? Montgomery links to, because in their heads, shared decision making and consent were two separate things. Um, as we went through the, gu- and right. I became a member of the guideline development group for it. Um, and as it went through the guideline, um, well, when you read the guideline now, it does talk about Montgomery in there. But in dentistry, we're a lot further ahead of the curve than the medics are in terms of consenting people because we're, we're surgeons. We're doing surgery on people, irreversible things. And so, so therefore, the consent that we get from people before every procedure we do is something that medics mm-hmm. tend not to do. Medics are just tending to talk mm-hmm. to people. Yeah. And I wonder how many GPs would, and, and this is no disrespect to GPs, but, you know, the antibiotic they go out, do they consent the no. patient for that? And and again, it's it's time as yeah. well, isn't it? So GPs it's... will do a lot less consent than dentists do, just because of the nature yeah. of, of the beast. Um, and when I was doing that yeah. systematic review, that was the there were two factors that were different between dentistry and medicine. Um, a, a GP, sorry, and the the issues were both about the fact that we are we are surgeons, dental surgeons, and mm. it was whether we felt that we had the ability to um, get on and do the. Uh, procedure during an urgent dental appointment rather than just giving an antibiotic yeah so um so i i developed an, a shared decision making intervention as part of my phd um did it with patients and with dental teams um and that is now um we've got a funding application at the moment again to the national institute for health research um research for patient benefit fund uh, and I'm waiting at oh, the moment excellent. to hear whether we've got through stage one of that application to be able to then go ahead and um, uh, evaluate. So the first stage of doing a clinical trial isn't to go ahead and do the clinical trial. The first stage is to say, is it feasible to do a clinical trial on this? Um, and because there's a whole range of different factors that might or might not work for it. Um, and so rather than spending the many millions of pounds of clinical trial costs, you just spend um, a few hundred thousand pounds doing your, your feasibility study. So that's the stage I'm at okay. at the moment. <clears throat> yeah. oh, that's good. That's excellent. I mean, it, it's just opened so many doors, the PhD, hasn't it? And that, and that, But I think that interest that you had from day one 
and the drive, particularly of being a mature student yes. through dentistry, is probably um, not half the battle, but certainly significant to, to yeah, you. Um, so I, I remember what, because I went through UCLan, it's a postgraduate course. And so yeah, everyone comes yeah. with a bit of background <clears throat> or something a bit different. Um, and I just yeah. think that we have to remember that we're not just dentists. You know, dentistry is what we do in the day job, but we are. Yeah people in the wider world and you know people bring lots of different things to the table with them when they when they come into dentistry Um, and some people have different passions as well you know I I enjoy the uh that thing of looking at the the bigger picture so um I started off with NICE and then I'm now on the BDA's health and science committee and I'm on the FDI science committee I was elected in the summer to um FDI World Dental Federation science committee and I'm chair of their antimicrobial working group so, you know, you push one door or you open one door and then the next mm. one swings open yeah. as well. And, yeah. and that PhD was an important part of it, but it wasn't the whole. There'll be yeah. a whole load of people who've done PhDs who don't get those sorts of opportunities. It's, it's yeah. having those lucky breaks. Um, it's saying Definitely. yes to things that you think, really, me, do that? <laughs> no, come on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, give, give it a go. Uh, uh, uh. And, and we mustn't forget that you are, you've been nominated in the top 50. <laughs> Yeah, apparently. I don't know what what what's the official title. I saw it on Twitter, yeah, but I didn't. I have no idea where that came from. Um, <laughs> apparently, in previous years, they have um, asked people just to nominate and vote for whoever they wanted to be the top fifty. Is it the most influential dentist? I don't know something like that. So, oh, that was it. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. did have a chuckle, but not but not the, that it's no, not deserving. This is, I think they've got like ninety six <clears throat> names on the list this year that they wanted people to select. Oh, from. okay. Well, um, you know, you've got to be in I it like, to win I, it. I, I, so I didn't know anything at all about it before they uh, before I saw it online and people started messaging me. But if you look at the big picture of it, where they've got like a composite of all the little pro- fate, um, like uh, head and neck yeah, pictures, the face, yeah. I'm bottom left or sorry, bottom right of the picture, which to me looks like a lower left wisdom tooth, which is <laughs> <laughs> always yeah, troublesome. Exactly. <laughs> So I guess leading on from that, um, and especially with COVID, this is probably quite timely, isn't it? You know, you, you said earlier that antibiotic prescribing just shot up and that, you know, I mean, the, the AAA advice was, that was what we were told to, or certainly, you know, I mean, not me because I was in secondary care, but certainly in primary care for UDCs, that that was the the only option yeah, really, it was wasn't it? Yeah, incredibly difficult it. time. I mean, so the bottom line was that the government didn't have enough PPE to go around for dentists to have them as well. We weren't prioritised as people who needed PPE. So therefore they needed to shut practices down and restrict dentistry. So we were working remotely. And when you're working remotely, it's really yeah, hard it's to really diagnose difficult. what yeah. someone's got. <clears throat> and it's even harder to treat them once you think you know what the diagnosis is. Yeah. Um, and yeah. because, you know, dentistry is a face-to-face, hands-on surgical profession, it, we're not like GPs. G- GP is, if my GP colleagues tell me it's very difficult to make the call on, I was talking to a GP, uh, one of the academic GPs at Manchester the other day, and he was saying that he had a patient who was pregnant who'd called it with X, Y, and Z, and, and he thought it was probably just something that needed a bit of advice. But if she, oh no, he'd, he'd prescribed something. I can't remember what he'd prescribed to her. But he said if she'd been there in the surgery, he'd have looked in the back of her eyes, and he didn't look in the back of her eyes, and he felt like he was he was working in yeah, a more risky way than he is used yeah. to. Yeah, and that's how it felt to it's us. It's so as well, difficult, wasn't it? isn't it? So I mean, my yeah. antibiotic prescribing probably doubled or even tripled during COVID. Um, and by that, what I mean is that where I'd normally prescribe about two antibiotics in a year, I probably prescribed five or six. Um, mm. So, and that was me still working two days a week um, through it. Yeah. So um, we had a lot of patients calling up. Um, yeah. so, and we were seeing people off the NHS 111 list as well, because in, in South Cumbria, we're, we've always had a massive shortage of dentists. You, you've probably seen some of the stuff about access to rural dentistry. Yeah, from, yeah. Um, which is crazy because it's such an i mean i was in the lakes last week it's such a gorgeous part of the world isn't it yeah it it is but it comes down to to um that thing i was saying about you've got a life outside of dentistry as well and yeah you might have seen it it's not for everybody it it really isn't and and if you select people you know dental school select people from the best uh, with the best a level results they're probably not from some of the more rural areas and so then when they come out to go and people try and get them to go and work in rural areas they go do you know what i'm not this isn't me i'm not from a rural area so you know take the golden handshake and then go back to 
it, it happens in medicine as well and it happens in other countries it's not just yeah, in, in yeah. the uk so we need to be looking at uh, recruiting people from rural areas into yeah. dental schools um in and region, retention yeah. really isn't it once you've got yeah, them because keep them once they're they go into dental schools they you know like i did you can go and work in london for a while but then you go back to where mm. home is um and yeah yeah and Cities are not for everybody, Absolutely are they? It's, um, but it is variable, yeah. So I guess leading on from all of that, um, trying to sway you over to the oral surgery side, um, you know, we've got and we've touched on the implant issue a little bit, and I, uh, it's so difficult. For, I think we definitely prescribe less. Um, and to, I mean, when I was a houseman, everybody having their whizzies out would get a shot of comoxiclav on the table and the seven day course, and that was that. That was you know, protocol, it doesn't matter what was wrong with the patient, that everybody got that. And obviously that, that that's a bit of an issue. Um, but I think nowadays we certainly, I'm really not reluctant to prescribe antibiotics, but if I've got a good clinical reason, and again, particularly wisdom teeth, you know, our registrars will say, oh, that was really hard, Richard. Do you think we should come to antibiotics? I'm like, well, can you justify it? Um, well, you know, and and if you don't, they come back on Monday after a Friday list with a big fat face and pus. Do you think well, oh, would would that one dose of antibiotic made a difference? So I think I think we do think certainly our undergraduates we we do drill it into them that you really must have a good reason to give an antibiotic, and the same with our registrars. But you know there is a time and a place where we have to, and we noticed as we were chatting earlier before we came online that. There was a bit of a, and I, you know, I'm going to be naive and honest. I thought the protocol now, first line treatment was not amoxicillin, but it was penicillin V. And the only time I ever used that was when I was doing an ENT job. And that was tonsillectomies, tonsillitis um, was pen V. But having chatted to you, I might be slightly off piece here. Um, well, sort of, but, but sort of not. Uh, so... The FGDP, is, as you know, is now um, F- FGDP and FDS were both part of the Royal College of Surgeons. Um, FDS is still Royal College of Surgeons. FGDP is now CG Dent. And the guidelines were updated. The antibiotic guidelines were updated so that they weren't just about primary dental care, but they covered all of the specialties as well. So oral surgeon and everything, or surgery and everything. And what they say in those guidelines are either amoxicillin or PEN-V. So a penicillin based drug is your first choice. I mean, it discusses the pros and cons of both of them. Um, it's the Scottish um, Health Improvement Scotland. They have a dental antibiotics group which has um, uh, recommended Pen V for dentists working in Scotland as being the first choice because it has a narrower spectrum. Um, however, SDCEP hasn't changed its guidelines because SDCEP is just BNF. So have I confused you yet? So no no you've you've made it clearer because I, I definitely and i you know i hold my hands up for for spreading that document that came out to all of our trainees and you know social media look over look everybody we need to yeah. now use pen v and and i haven't switched to pen v i'll be very yeah. honest with you so um, let me, let me and i don't know anybody what it says in the fgdp okay. fds update <clears throat> which was december 2020 um scotland the the um health improvement scotland guys were really keen that um FDS and FGDP guidelines should swap to recommend PENV. Um, and their rationale for that is that they are oral microbiologists um, and they want everything to be as narrow as possible because um, as microbiologists and infectious diseases specialists, they see the problems of resistant infections that come through the yeah. door. <clears throat> so just like with infective endocarditis, it's the cardiologists who see the problem of someone having infective endocarditis. Yeah. Yeah. And you as oral surgeons see the problem of someone having... I don't know, osteomyelitis after something that's gone on. Yeah. Um, uh, and so you tend to go with what you see, right, the, the feedback you get afterwards, rather than not, yeah. not knowing what's going on. So um, the in, the infectious diseases and oral, oral um, microbiologists would like us to go for the narrowest possible spectrum penicillin, um, okay. which would, would be PEN-V. Pen-V. Um, but PEN-V has to be given four times a day on an empty stomach. Mm. So your compliance four is times a day low. on an empty stomach is actually quite difficult. My mum had to do it the other day for yeah. something. Um, I yeah. couldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm always eating. <laughs> yeah, even if even if you only eat at meal times, it's still actually quite difficult to do it. Um, and yeah. so um, amoxicillin is a slightly broader spectrum. See, my view on it would be that 
you should be trying to get rid of that eighty percent over prescribing. Um, and, and actually, yeah, the, rather than, the drug yeah. that you're giving is less important. Yeah, it's the overprescribing. The overprescribing is the issue. in the first place is the issue. Yeah, and like yeah. you say, just so it's about people just giving themselves that time before they write a prescription to say, is writing a prescription the right thing to do? Does this patient mm. need it? And what happens if something goes wrong for this patient? So it's it's about the risks to the individual patient. So they could have anaphylaxis. Um, that does happen and they could have c diff that does happen to dental antibiotics as well as to um uh, to ho- uh, hospital based antibiotics yeah. um and obviously antibiotic resistance as well the thing about resistance is it's massive and you'll see i've seen the news in the last few days the lancet report says that there are 1.5 or 1.3 i think it was million deaths um, attributed to antibiotic resistant infections in 2019 that's a huge number that's double what the estimates were five years ago and i think we're we just uh, i wouldn't say we're oblivious to it but you're right if you don't see it it doesn't ring any bells does it so when i'm lecturing i'll sometimes say um who do you know who suffered from an antibiotic resistant infection um people go i don't know um, who's had someone who, in close to them who's had cancer and died from cancer? And they say, oh, yeah. So did they die from yeah. cancer or did they die from the infection that they had while they had, were having the cancer the treatment? Answer, yeah. Is their immune yeah. compromised? And the, they've had to have antibiotic after antibiotic after antibiotic for the pneumonia, the urinary tract infection, whatever it is. Very often people die with cancer but from a resistant infection. And yeah. The, yeah. Um, the medics are who are certifying death are reluctant to write antibiotic resistance on the um, on the death mm. certificate because uh, it impacts on their practice on on, on their practice on their yeah. hospital. Yeah, those figures start adding yeah. up, um, and they don't know that it was the resistant infection. You know, maybe it was the cancer that took them rather than the infection. It's a bit, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a lot prove, like the COVID it? deaths. You know, um, yeah, they die with oh, yeah. COVID or of COVID, and how do you tell the difference? And yeah. So you know, the figures that we're getting for that are died with COVID in the last tested positive for covid in the last 30 days before they died yeah Um, and i think we'll probably need to go that direction for resistance because until people start seeing that oh look auntie jean died um, of a resistant infection on the death certificate yeah you need word to get out don't you so the the welcome trust call it a sense of personal jeopardy you need to think that it's something that could happen to me i mean antibiotic resistance could happen to you your friends or your family is the phrase that that Mm. we're encouraged to use yeah um but you don't really feel that until you start seeing it it's like covid isn't it you start seeing it happening to people around you and you go oh this is getting a bit real yeah definitely and i guess um so that kind of brings me on a little bit to prophylactic antibiotics i don't know whether this is your arena Mm. or or not really but you know, we've shifted from, and there's so many papers about, do you give prophylactic antibiotics before certain types of surgery? And I think, I think there are a certain group of patients that we would probably agree would need them. Um, but certainly for things like, you know, bone grafting, implants, sinus lifts, uh, surgery that you think is going to involve the sinus, or, uh, you know, patients who've got males like ashtrays do we need to give them something just to try and help us what i mean what's the general i mean i can tell you what the oral surgery world thinks um but i think from from your perspective with your research and background what what what's the vibe about prophylactic antibiotics and also and i don't know if you'll be able to answer this i i was told many years ago by a microbiologist that if you give them an oral dose half an hour before what we would say knife to skin that's almost as effective as giving them an iv dose Oh, I don't know about that bit. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll, yeah. we'll park that. But the, the prophylactic yeah. stuff, I mean, it, it, it was, actually, may, maybe you could... You're ringing a bell now on something I read last week, um, where it was treatment okay. of infective endocarditis, which has always been IV. And they're now saying, actually, do you know what? Oral's just as effective. So yeah. it wouldn't surprise yeah. me at all. Um, okay. So um, prophylaxis, it's interesting, actually. So in the UK... Um, I talked about 80% over prescribing and that's all mm. um, uh, therapeutic use of antibiotics. Okay. Um, in America, there are far more prophylactic antibiotics given yeah. than therapeutic antibiotics given in dentistry. And they have a 80% over prescribing, but that's of prophylactic antibiotics. So that's interesting, isn't it? Because you, well, 
is it over prescribing or is it, is it actually preventing so prescribing not in accordance with guidelines yeah right and and are their guidelines as strict as ours no no no, no. and that's why they have an awful <laughs> lot more uh, prescribing prophylactic prescribing yeah. than we do so they they, I mean, they prescribe just like the rest of the world do apart from uk they prescribe for infective endocarditis people at risk of infective endocarditis yeah um, but they don't prescribe for or their guidelines aren't for prescribing for prosthetic joints um and they're okay. not for prescribing for um oh, what's the other one i was going to say uh impl- implants of some sort um right i mean it's interesting you touch on the infective endocarditis i, I think I won't say what I do, but I think the general consensus is to give it with patient involvement in you know that 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 shared decision making. Yeah. Even though the guidance says not routinely, because I think and I, I don't know if you've ever heard Martin Thornhill speak. I have. Um, um, have you heard the Leeds cardiologist speak though on this as well? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> this could be like a yeah. battle of the greats, so couldn't I, it? I, I'm not uh, going to get into the the battle of all of that. I just think that we. The it's difficult that, though, isn't it? Well, it's really so the thing that will keep you safe is prescribing in accordance with guidelines. Um, and yeah, they, they... but that that word not routinely. Yeah, you know nothing's routine, is it? Um, so I would say so. There have been a few times in my career where I have offered a patient prophylactic antibiotics, um, and I have um, for one reason or I remember one particular the patient was on warfarin and x y and z mm. and i was like well you can't have this and you can't have that um and yeah. you know the, the risk of um i think clindamycin was the drug i was going to offer her um and so the risk of clindamycin is um the, obviously it's really linked to c diff c diff um, yeah and with my anti-dying in blackpool hospital of c diff um uh We'll talk about that in a bit, if you like, about how the hospitals reduce their CD yeah, yeah. rates by reducing their antibiotic prescribing of certain antibiotics. Um, then I, I just said to her, look, should we just should we just do it without? And actually, we did it without, which was fine. The bit that wasn't fine, mm. and we did it first thing in the morning, luckily, early in the week. But um, her warfarin um, had obviously oh, okay. um, wasn't quite as low on the day that we took the tooth out as the... As the, the INR suggested, suggested yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, yeah, that was that was an interesting one. So yeah, um, it, it, it is interesting yeah. though, on the um, in America their guidelines, prophylactic guidelines, used to be amoxicillin first choice and uh, clindamycin second choice, not just for mm. prophylaxis, sorry for for everything. Um, and right, okay. they started noticing, um, and there's a paper in the literature which re- related community C diff rates to dental antibiotic prescribing because. Um, they mm. were really, really high. And the Americans couldn't understand why UK rates of C. diff were so much lower than their rates. Um, and they realised that it's, uh, and again linked to a Martin Thornhill paper, that clindamycin has an associated death rate with it. Um, and if you're giving mm. something for um, an elective treatment, then you really don't want to be doing something that's got an associated death rate with it. Really. Yeah, yeah. So, um you know, trying to stop stopping infective endocarditis by causing C. difficile is, isn't great. <laughs> yeah, because um, these yeah. patients are, um, are sick in the first place, which is why. <laughs> why exactly. Yeah. Going on. yeah, it's difficult. So, isn't the, it? um, Blackpool Hospital, which is where my um, auntie was uh, about twenty years ago now, it must be. Um, and I think you said you worked at Doncaster Hospital as well, which has had a similar um, strategy at one point. Mm. The, yeah. the rates of C. diff um, linked to colmoxiclav to clindamycin um, to third generation cephalosporins and ciprofloxacin mm. is so I got that right I think it's ciprofloxacin is so high that um, in those hospitals the way that they cut their C. diff rates was by saying that clinicians could only give those particular antibiotics if they had a signature from an oral microbiologist saying that it was necessary yeah. to do yeah. that um, and that's uh, interesting uh, isn't it and I you know, I, I was challenged um, by several colleagues because Comoxlav was the first line and, you know, I tried, to, I brought in guidelines and it's difficult when you're in a trust because you're dictated to some extent by yeah. the trust and the microbiology guidelines. But certainly at Doncaster, the consultant microbiologists were like, this this drug is not to be prescribed. Um, and and I guess some, the way my colleagues got around it, because on an outpatient prescription or an FP10, you know, they don't have any jurisdiction over that. Whereas if it's in hospital and it's going through the system, yeah. 
it was an electronic prescribing so system then you couldn't why do, do they it think that those patients would benefit from colmoxiclav over just amoxicillin i think i think one is is uh, ignorance um uh, one is uh, history that that's just what and i don't know why certainly in my max fox training that that was the drug of choice whether it's because people feel it's it's you know spectrum is so broad um it's almost like domestos to the mouth it will kill anything and and we'll have no problems yeah, with it but it quite doesn't. clearly well yeah and also causes issues yeah. elsewhere so and i think in hospitals it comoxlev is still quite um quite commonplace um so yeah so it's interesting that um and, and i could be wrong here but i i'm i was going to say that general dental practice practices can't prescribe it on an fp10 is no, that you can prescribe it it's not but you shouldn't prescribe it it's not oh, okay. within guidelines so if you're thinking okay. about prescribing it think twice about why you... so the only reason you would want to prescribe comoxiclav is if you think that they've got a resistant infection and if you think they've got a resistant infection yeah. you really need culture and sensitivity testing um, exactly and that's not something yeah. you do in primary yeah. dental care so if you if you no. think i mean why would you think someone's got a resistant infection it might be because you've given amoxicillin already and it didn't work well, that's not the time yeah. to be thinking about, oh, I'll, I'll try comoxiclav, see if that one will work. No. If they've got an infection and it's going somewhere, they, that needs to be seen. Um, and if, if, they've yeah. got an inf- if they haven't got an infection that's going somewhere, then then they, do, why do they need antibiotics? It's um, Yeah, and you would hope that if they've come back having had a course of antibiotics that you feel was appropriate, yeah. that you recognise that for some reason this has failed, whether it's compliance or you know, wrong drug, um, wrong diagnosis, then then you need to be getting somebody else's eyes on that really, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I had an interesting case a few years ago with um, um, a patient that had been given metronidazole for pericoronitis from a colleague. And um, the they came back three days late. It was a Saturday I was working the Saturday and uh, I was the only dentist in. So they came to see me and they said uh, three days later, the metro- maybe four days later, the metronidazole's not working. It's making me feel really grim. And actually it's spread onto both sides now. I was like, bilateral pericoronitis. That's a bit weird. And they said, do I need to keep taking the antibiotics? And I'm like, no, not if it's spread. <laughs> it's- and I looked at the mouth. <laughs> That's yeah, not she working. She had bright red tonsils. And I just said, I-, I think you've probably got a viral infection. I think you need to go and see yeah. a GP. So story i didn't work for because this was when i was only working one day a week so they went off to see um on the monday morning they came into the practice again so one of the other dentists got a prescription for amoxicillin three days later came back again and saw another dentist but by this point well wendy being wendy had gone off and had a look through the literature thinking bilateral pericoronitis i've not heard of that before it seems a bit strange so i looked it up and it um said it's really related to glandular fever so i'd emailed the other clinician saying look do you think we ought to be contacting her and really suggest checking that she's been to see the gp like i recommended <coughs> and they went yeah. oh she's already had amoxicillin from us and so the, the guy who saw her on the day she came in the same day that i emailed he said to her oh he goes um you know we think it may well be viral like wendy said on saturday have you been to see a gp and um you know, we think it might be glandular fever, for example. And the mum sat in the corner for the 21 year old patient mum sat in the corner and went, Oh, I've just recovered from glandular fever. <laughs> <laughs> and so then the dentist is like, Why on earth did you yeah. did you not listen to the dentist when she said your antibiotics aren't working? Go and see a GP for something else. She said, Oh, well, because I like going to the gym and I thought the GP had tell me I couldn't go to the gym. So the antibiotics uh, would be able to mean that I could go brilliant. to the gym. And you're like, oh <laughs> so yes. But you, you've you've led nicely onto metronidazole mm. there, and um, just before we kind of wrap up, I think uh, for me, I have a bit of an issue with metronidazole being the first line treatment for pericoronitis because I was certainly always taught that you know any dental infection is usually polymicrobial, and because metronidazole is you know anaerobic specific, it is that of help on its own for an oral infection or what's the what i don't know if you'll know but what what's their rationale behind that um only that there's some studies around it um i don't know whether it's ever been studied one one drug versus another drug i've not i've not seen any literature on that i was i was in the literature the other day on on stuff but i've not not seen one versus the other okay um what i do know is that um again um, pericoronitis is usually sorted out just by irrigating underneath the gums and giving them lots. Of yeah, I mean that that would be the yeah. first line, but certainly, you know, if it says they come back and there's some evidence of systemic infection, consider yeah. metro. And it's just always, 
yeah, I've always thought, oh, I just have a bit of a problem with that. But um, maybe that's just. Oh, well, just I know, me. again, that Scottish um, group that we were talking about, the Health Improvement Scotland, I know that they are looking yeah. at um, metronidazole because there's quite a lot of resistance. One of the biggest areas of increasing resistance to antibiotics is metronidazole resistance. Oh, okay. That's um, interesting. And so um, they're looking at what the alternatives could be and should be. Um, and I think that they were considering at one point whether to go with clindamycin um, or. Yeah. Uh, so in, in America, so what not... they've done, you know, you know, I said that they've swapped away from clindamycin as their second choice drug. They've gone to cephalosporins as their second choice. Right. Okay. Because I mean, that, that's the other thing. You know, they, they say, "Oh, you." Uh, the guidance says if your patient's allergic to penicillin, give them mm-hmm. metronidazole. But if you were treating that infection with penicillin, you were treating it with penicillin for a reason because of the uh, the the, the mm-hmm. bacteria. If you then switch to metronidazole, you, you're targeting a completely different group aren't you so that's always astonished me a little bit as well yeah um Um, so anything that isn't penicillin is a less good choice and there are studies so even you know for penicillin allergic patients um there is studies that show that they have um a worse outcome from antibiotic treatment than if they'd been given a penicillin drug and very often the people who say that they're allergic to penicillin or think that they're allergic to penicillin actually aren't Um, and Haunt, so yeah. Yeah, there is a school of thought that says you should just give them give them penicillin unless you've actually got evidence oh, right. that they have. Yeah. See what happens. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you, you get the patients, they're always, you know, what happens? Oh, I get a bit of diarrhea and vomiting. You know, it, it's probably not yeah. an allergy, is it? But you just don't know. And it would just be my luck yeah. that and I had that with a patient who said she was allergic to lignocaine and I didn't believe her and she was. Oops. So... I, yeah, yeah so, so, <laughs> I did look so a bit of an idiot. I um, bring this up is that the World Health Organization is doing an antibiotics handbook and they have a dental chapter in it that's um, they're actually open for consultation at the moment on this draft. Oh. Um, and at FDI, we saw an early, early draft or oh, the early draft was dreadful. But the current draft is is let me say it's slightly better. better. It, uh, OK, <laughs> the first the first draft would have if we had a first year dental student submitting that as a assignment, they'd have failed. It was really that bad. Oh. Um, you, uh, every single sentence had something wrong with it. <laughs> it was awful. Um, the current <clears> one isn't, well, it's... isn't great, but it's better than than the, the first draft was. Okay. Um, uh, but in there, and our big point of principle was that they said they weren't putting any um, alternatives to penicillin allergic patients because so few penicillin allergic patients are really penicillin allergic. And FDI's perspective is that um, if you're giving if you're giving someone an antibiotic in dentistry, it's because they really need one and you know, it's very close to a lot of vital structures and you really don't want those infections going places quickly. And yeah. you also don't want yeah. more inflammation from um, from an no. anaphylactic reaction. It's, you know, you're making an ill patient iller by doing that. Yeah. So, yeah, um, yeah that, we're going back on that at the moment. But uh, it, it is interesting. I, I suspect uh, we've already been around the boy once with World Health Organization. They weren't for moving last time. Okay. We'll we'll wait with anticipation yeah. then. <laughs> well, Wendy, it's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, for those listeners that that don't know you, you you are very active on Twitter. Um, it must be glued to your well, yeah, glued to your hand because every time I tweet you, you just respond so quickly. Um, so it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for spending time with me, having a chat about uh, everything antibiotic wise, and it's been really interesting hearing your career pathway as well, which I'm sure many people will will be very envious of and I'm certainly envious that your PhD is ticked in the box and mine isn't (laughs) yet Um, so thanks very much and uh, I uh, hope to speak to you soon it's been a pleasure